Hello everyone, today we will be discussing Olson's theory of collective actions. So, this is one of the seminal theories that deal with uh, that deals with the collective action problems or issues related to the uh, public goods again. And basically his arguments falls in the broad area, broad disciplinary area of economics and political science. And uh, if you see go through this uh, book, the logic of collective action, it provides a very original thought on the theory of group and the organizational behavior itself. So, uh, the theory explains that most organization they do uh, produce collective, collective uh, goods or public goods and, and uh, for that reason the, uh, the members need to pay for it. But however, this logic is not meant for the large groups and in most of the cases in the large groups this uh, provision of the, of the uh, public goods it is not uh, uh, successfully provided or it, it may not actually successfully happen. So, uh, in this context the book is actually a key uh, document that can provide that why the group members behave in a particular manner when their size is large or size is small. So, this is what you can say that it will be giving a kind of strategies for the performance uh, for successful provision of the collective goods, collective actions and collective goods in the uh, event of the size of the group and the organization itself. If you see uh, the, uh, the original idea, then we can say that uh, his book is uh, the logic of the collective action, public goods and the, and the theory of groups. And he has written this in 1965. And if you see the disciplinary background of uh, the author, Mankar Olson, so uh, he is trained in economics. However, his writings are more uh, towards the social issues. And uh, if you see the major publications that he contributed for, uh, for uh, the society, so they are the logic of the collective action in 65, rise and decline of nations in 82 and the power and prosperity he published in 2000. So, all these major, uh, if you see this major publications he had, so all these ideas and arguments are actually meant for so the societal problems and their solutions. And uh, in this context, we need to see that uh, this piece of work, the logic of collective action is an application of economic reasoning to the group behavior. That what is the factors behind the group behavior? Why a particular group is, is behaving in a particular manner in different uh, situation, particularly in providing the case of public actions or public goods. So, if you see uh, uh, this, this book, then it actually uh, highlights the two things differentiating that the individual behavior is obviously different from the group behavior. And uh, why we are saying that individual behavior is different from the group beha behavior? Because if you see generally uh, the, uh, the, the common perception is that the individual will behave rationally and that is why they will always try to maximize their self interest in order to achieve a particular objective that is self interest. And uh, following this logic, when this individual will be in a particular group, they will also be guided by this rationalism or rationality and they will also try to achieve the group objective. This is behind the common perception we do have. But however, uh, he has found that this very perception is wrong because individual behavior in a particular situation that is in satisfying his own self interest is different from the interest of the group itself. That is why maybe individual when he is actually uh, uh, making efforts in fulfill in achieving a particular target. So, he will be guide by, guided by the principle of rationalism, but whereas he will be one of the member in a group, he will not be guided by that principles. So, that is why the individual behavior and group behavior for a particular individual is also different. So, this is in contrast to the popular or common perceptions regarding the group behavior. So, what is, the, what is this popular perception or common perception regarding this group behavior? It is interesting to see that when economic objectives are involved, groups of individuals with common interest usually come forward to attend this common interest. So, that means they are self-organized, 
they autom automatically come forward if they do have common interest and they will form a group to, to attend the common uh, group objective itself. So, in the history itself we can find so many examples, the majority of the major examples we can take like your labor unions. So, in case of labor unions, the uh, whosoever are the members, the labor unions they, they try to safeguard the interest of each of the members. So, th so that means here if the members or if the persons they do have common uh, objectives that is how to safeguard the uh, re labor uh, related issues, they are coming under this labor unions in order to safeguard this end. So, that is why uh, uh, it is uh, the common perception is that people who are having common interests, they automatically come forward form a group to satisfy the common interest itself. So, here is the picture of this, this uh, group behavior that if there is some shared interest, some common interest then people obviously come together and form a group. However, Olson opined that this perception is not generally the case. For the first time he argued that this may be the opposite to the conventional or established kind of group behavior that we are right now having that people having common interest automatically come together to form a group for achieving a shared interest or a common goal and it is out of the self in instinct or self organizations. So, this is the common uh, established conventional established belief on the group behavior, but this fellow Olson he has argued that this is not so. And if you are going through the first page the introductory part of the book then we can find the example of la uh, labor union theories take into account the Marxian case even. And uh, he has written down there that it is often taken for granted at least when economic objectives are involved that groups of individuals with common interests usually attempt to further this common interest. And which he refutes this conventional uh, perception and uh, and uh, how and he also found to be uh, the case that it is very exceptional that individuals in a group disregard their personal welfare altruistically. So, here uh, it is just to highlight that uh, individuals in the group act out of the self interest. So, it is the assumption behind this view, but however this may not work always individuals may not be uh, motivated by the uh, selfless activities or be altruistic all, uh, altogether. So, if, if the individuals in a group altruistically disregarded their personal welfare that is maximizing their own self interest. So, it would not be very likely that collectively they would seek some selfish end or selfish common or group objectives. So, uh, in this case he um, draws the conclusion that such kind of altruism that thinking for others, thinking from the group objectives to be satisfied is considered to be highly exceptional and self interested behavior is usually the rule that we are actually exper experiencing. And if at all the groups they tend to act in support of group interest that is how to achieve the group interest itself based on this logic that individuals are following the rationality or they are actually guide, guided by the rational and self interested behavior. Then Olson's ars, uh, answer to this conventional belief is that uh, he actually wrote down, he opined in, uh, in this uh, book, narrated in this book, but it is not in fact that the idea that groups will act in the self interest follows logically from the premise of rational and self interested behavior. And uh, here we can actually take into account this rational and, and self interested individuals will not act voluntarily to achieve the common or group interest. So, that is what you can say that group behavior and individual behavior will be different based on this logic that may be in case of uh, individual behavior in fulfilling their own interest they will be following this uh, this um, rationality and self interest 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 motive, but however in the group they will not display the same motive. So, what is the reason behind that? why they will not actually pursue the same rationality and self uh, and self interest individuals for the uh, group objectives as well. So, he viewed that it does not follow because of this this uh, this logic that all the all of the individuals in a group would gain 
if, if they achieve the group objectives that means if the group objectives are achieved so obviously the benefits will be shared if the benefits will be shared if i am not the party even to contribute for uh, for the achievement of the group objectives then only uh, then also i can also get the benefit out of it so what is the need that why i will be contributing my efforts for fulfilling the group interest so in that time and resources i can actually uh, fulfill my other self interest or the other vested interest and the exception is that this may work that means the individuals may also find they uh, find uh, they the individuals may also be guided by the rationality the self rationality in order to fulfill this uh, group interest if the number of individuals uh, in the group is quite small or there is a kind of course on a force or a monitoring system or some special device is there who can guide the individuals or there is a some system which actually motivate provide some kind of incentive to the individuals to act for fulfilling the group interest then only this kind of rationality which are meant for the individual interest that they can also equally be applicable in achieving the group interest as well otherwise it will not so in this condition we are just highlighting that what are those conditions which we must take into account in order to see that how the individuals they can also work their rationality or actually use their uh, principle of rationality for attending attending the group behavior is the number of individuals in a group to be very small and there should be some kind of coercions or some other special devices are there which can motivate these individuals for achieving the common interest and uh, rational and self interested individuals otherwise they will not act to achieve their common interest so this is the the three conditions um if it is fulfilled then only the uh, particular individuals they might think about fulfilling the interest of the group as well so these are the three uh, three conditions the the conditions are is that the group should be small so in this case the individuals may think to fulfill the uh, interest of the of the group itself or there is a provision a kind of a kind of coercion some system should be there which should be very forceful do it otherwise you will be penalized or a some some kind of a uh, governance is there who is actually guiding you who is actually uh, um, looking the kind of efforts you are making then only or you can say that there is some kind of other device device so maybe in terms of a good coordinations or the mechanisms that we are actually following so in this case only the individuals they will act for fulfilling the group interest so being rational they can follow this rationality in fulfilling the group objectives otherwise they can, they will not be interested in fulfilling the group objectives why this is happening why their behavior is so different in this two contexts the first one is your personal interest personal cause and the second one is your group interest your group objectives why they the, the same individual they are behaving so differently so he wrote this it is because of the free rider problem the tendency of the free rider problem the larger the group the less is uh, further its common interest so who is he term that it is a case of free rider, rider problem and it is because of this free rider problem the individuals are motivated not to make any effort for achieving the uh, common objectives or group objectives they are all, they always think that we can actually get the same collective good free of cost why we are going to make our contributions or effort in full, fulfilling the group objectives if after at all the group objectives are to be uh, achieved or uh, is achieved then obviously the equal share can be met can be provided to the individual as well so in this context he wrote that the amounts of the collective good that a member of the group receives free from the members will further reduce his incentive to provide more of that good at his own expense 
and this, this situation is known as the free, free rider problem or this situation gives rise to the free rider, rider problem. So, if this is the situation no individual will be actually um, getting uh, incentive to provide something for the achievement of the collective goods. And Olson argues that this problem of free rider is the very central problem not only in the public policy or societal issues, but also political science and economic theory, uh, politics as well as political economy. So, the application of this, this, this uh, free rider problem and the application of understanding the group behavior is utmost importance even in the today's world. Although we can explore that uh, after this uh, new uh, liberalism period, so whether uh, this, this uh, theory is also applicable to the to our context. So, this is what you can say we can explore further in understanding once you understand the, the very core of the uh, theory itself. So, now let us discuss what is the main argument of this theory. The first one is that the larger the group, the further it will fall short of providing an optimal amount of collective good because of this free rider problem. So, what is the meaning of this? So, that means we need to say we are just comparing the size of the group and the, the possibility for achieving the collective good. So, if the size of the good is large, uh, group is large that means there are many members are existing. So, the group size is large. So, as a result the possibility for providing the optimum amount of the collective good it will be low. Again what is the reason that we have already discussed that everyone will be thinking that if at all the public good or, or the collective good uh, is provided then obviously they will be getting out of free. So, they do not have, uh, have to contribute anything they will automatically get the share because it is collective good and the benefits are shared. Because of this reason the larger the group then we will be finding that the, the possibility of uh, providing this optimal amount of collective good will be low. And however, in case of the other groups that is where this, the members group members are few in numbers they are called the small groups they can easily actually uh, fulfill this uh, collective uh, uh, goods. And it is interesting find, find, to find this that in, in small groups with common, common interests. So, there is a surprising tendency for the exploitation of the great by the small itself. So, what is the meaning of exploitation of the great by the small? Is it possible? So, it means that in case, so here we are only focusing, we are analyzing the case of small groups only, not the large groups, where members are very few and the frequency of interaction is very often. So, uh, the interaction among the group members it occurs many times. So, in this context if you are talking about this uh, this um, small groups and we are saying that the exploitation of the great by the small. So, it means small groups tend to devote too few resources to the satisfactions for the common interest in fulfilling uh, or in, in providing the collective uh, good and it is surprising to see the tendency for the lesser members of the small group itself, they will exploit the greater members by making them bear a disproportionate share of the burden of any group action. So, here we just want to say that when the lesser member they are paying actually less very less for the provision of the common interest that is collective actions. And if at all the collective goods are to be provided, then the burden will be more on the large sections or large members. So, that is why when large members or the greater members they are paying the most uh, majority of the burden for uh, the collective actions. So, that can be that you can in this case you can say the majority members or the greater members they are actually bearing a heavy portion or a disproportionate portion of the burden of the collective actions in comparison to the smaller members they are paying for the same collective actions in this small group. So, 
In this con uh, context, it is interesting to analyze and find the correlations or the kind of relations that is existing between the group size and the organizational behavior or group behavior. So, here we are discussing between two groups, one is your uh, small groups and the second one is large groups and how the members would be behaving in these two contexts. So, let us take the first case that in case of large groups, here as you understand that members they are getting proportionally uh, smaller benefit from a collective good because they have to pay more, but whatever the benefit they are getting out of this provision of the collective good, the share is so small because it is shared by shared among all the individuals or members and here the members are too large. So, uh, as a result a single member he or she will be getting a proportionally very small benefit out of this collective good and this is because the individual will be contributing very less because of a smaller region a smaller return. So, in this case of large groups the individual they do understand that whatever uh, for, for the uh, provision of collective good we need to pay more, but the say the benefit out of this collective good will be less. So, that means a particular member particular individual member he or she will be getting a very smaller fraction of the benefit in comparison to the cost he contributes for the for the provision of the collective good itself. Therefore, the individual member they will try to contribute less because anticipating a smaller return out of it. And the second one is that second reason is that why their behavior is so the uh, a single member in a large group he or she is likely to act for all unless individual return is more than its cost of action. So, in that case only uh, in that case even. So, if the individual member is not finding enough benefit and if he is perceiving that his cost is more than the benefit he is anticipating then he will not actually participate. And therefore, because of this two reason it needs for course on or a kind of forceful something forceful should be there. So, that it can enforce how to provide the uh, collective goods among the members itself. So, this is the, the, the story of collective good provision for the uh, uh, large group itself. And if you see the very uh, peculiar feature, features that for the large groups to fail to provide themselves with any collective good at all, whereas in contrast to the large groups in case of the uh, small groups there is a tendency towards a suboptimal provision of collective goods. So, here we are just highlighting that how the provision of the collective goods would be different in these two uh, groups. So, far the size is concerned. See in case of the large groups, so there is always a trend tendency for, for, uh, for less tendency you can say to provide the collective goods. So, it will fail the tendency will fail in case of large groups, but in case of small groups there is a tendency for achieving a suboptimal provision of collective goods. So, so far the very provision of collective goods uh, is concerned in the first case that is in case of large goal groups the tendency is not enough that is why tendency is failing to provide the groups with the collective good. Whereas, in case of small goods there would be some tendency uh, for providing the collective goods, but this amount of provision of collective goods what you can say it is less than the optimal that is a case of the suboptimal provision of collective goods. So, suboptimal provision of collective goods may be provided uh, in the small groups whereas, as the tendency will be failing there is no tendency for providing the collective goods. So, in case of the large groups the provision of collective goods is not actually possible. Therefore, he argued that the larger the group the further it will fall short of providing an optimal amount of 
collective goods. So, because of this uh, logic he has drawn this conclusion that when the size of the group increases then the optimal amount of provision of collective good will be decreasing. But in case of small group each member they will be getting proportionately more benefit out of this collective good provision in comparison in comparison to the cost they will be incurring towards this provision. So, the collective uh, uh, good provided by the voluntary, rational and unilateral action of one or two members who find that their reward for providing the good is enough in comparison to the cost they pay, then they will be coming forward for providing the public uh, collective good itself. And that is why the collective provision, collective good provision will happen because of this cost benefit analysis, maybe two members, one members, more than uh, one or two members. So, but they are the minority members who will be thinking that, that whatever they are uh, incurring the cost for provisioning of this uh, collective good is less than the benefit they will be receiving for it. And since others pay the, pay the cost and some some members of the of the uh, small groups they see no uh, incentive to provide the good and as a result it will lead to the end of exploitation by the small itself that means the burden is actually shared by others so it is a case where we can actually end the exploitation by the small itself so another um, logic he propounded in this context of group size and uh, group behavior is that based on uh, the very size of the group and so far the small group size uh, is concerned, there are two types of non-market groups. The first one is the privileged groups and the second one is the intermediate groups. So, what exactly is the uh, privileged group or what is the situation where you can say the privileged group conditions has arrived and where the conditions for the intermediate groups uh, has arrived. So, and again we are saying that this is the, the groups which can be actually felt in case of the small group itself. So, now let us understand the case of the privileged groups. So, it can be characterized as or you can say this, this privileged group is a group such that each of its members or at least some of them has an incentive to see that the collective good is provided. So, it is so, it is because some of the members they do have incentive in providing the collective goods, even if the particular individual he or she has to bear the full burden of providing it by herself or by himself. This is because the provision of the public uh, collective good will happen and the reason is, is that it is because there is an incentive by a particular member or group of members. So, in, in inside the, uh, the uh, small group itself that is why the provision of the public goods will automatically happen. And again this provision of the, the, uh, the collective goal, uh, good can also be obtained without any group organization or group coordination because the incentive is very strong. The incentive is so strong in case of this privileged group that the provision of collective uh, goods will happen whether uh, or not the uh, individual has to bear all the uh, burden uh, of providing the uh, collective good itself. Whereas, if you see the second type of uh, group which is also a subset of uh, the uh, small group is the intermediate group. So, in case of intermediate group here no single member gets a share of benefit sufficient enough to give him give him or give her an incentive to provide the good himself or herself. So, here in comparison to the first one here we are lacking incentives. So, because here we are lacking incentives why we are again uh, in case of intermediate goods we are lacking incentives it is because the share of benefits is not sufficient. When the, when the collective goods is provided, the benefit a particular individual is getting, it is not sufficient to induce him or her to provide 
the collective Godhead self. And because the size of the group is small and that is why the, the members does not have uh, or uh, this, this group does not have many members to notice that what the other members are, are looking to or are doing whether any other member is helping or attempting to provide the collective good or not. So, in such a group in this conditions there is it is likely that the collective goods may or equally may not be, a, uh, be obtained. And no collective good would ever be obtained without some group coordination or group organizations. So, in the first case in this group we are saying that, that because of this, this uh, um, lack of incentives the particular individual in this group he will not be getting enough motivation to provide the collective good. And the second is that if at all the collective good is to be provided then it can be provided with the help of group coordination or group organizations otherwise it is not possible. And the main reason behind this is that the lack of incentives because again the benefits or the proportion of the benefit is not sufficient enough to induce the individual members for, provi for providing the collective good. So, this is the subsets two subsets of the small group itself and their characteristics that whether they will be providing they will be uh, providing the collective good or not and in, in which conditions they would be thinking to provide thinking to act for the provision of collective good. And the second group is the latent group which we are also saying the large group. So, in case of this large group the members do not have incentive to act to obtain the collective good itself. And what is the reason behind it that whatever the um, benefit that will be obtained by the provision of the collective good it will be shared by all the members itself in the group. Therefore, this process or in this group it does not actually offer any single individual member enough incentive to pay for the organizations those who are working in this latent group interest or to bear any other way of the cost of the necessary collective actions. And only a separate or a special kind of incentives if it can be stimulated to this rational individual in this latent group then they may act the way group is demanding or what you can say that they can actually um, make an effort for fulfilling the group objectives. So, here the case is that in case of the uh, firstly in case of this large group or latent group it is unlikely to have the provision of collective good because of no incentive for obtaining the collective good itself. And second is that collective, uh, collective goods can be provided given the condition that a separate and a selective incentive will be provided that can stimulate the rational individual members to act towards achieving the group oriented objectives. And in, in, in this situations that we have described in this conditions the group action can be obtained only through an incentives that operates like collective good and this is the only reason that how collective goods can be provided to uh, this uh, large groups. And moreover Olson argued that this incentive must be selective because you are you are you can find a large set of incentives, but we need to be selective that in which context for this Latin group which kind of incentives may be uh, provided so that the individuals can join hands for the for achieving the group interest. And here there is a necessity to 
separate these two sections that who do not join the organization working for group interest and the groups which can be which which work towards the attainment of the group objectives. So, if you are drawing a difference and making them treated differently, then there would be some kind of incentives that can be generated in this way. The way we are uh, uh, dealing these two uh, two persons or two kind of persons differently. So, again, he highlighted that creating incentives inside the members is a, is really a task and that is why we need to be very selective in in making the strategies that how these individual members can get enough incentives for fulfilling the group objectives itself. Under this Latin groups there is a kind of subset of groups which is known as mobilized Latin groups. So, what is mobilized Latin groups? So, as you have already understood that in case of Latin goods there is less chance that the members would get the, uh, the collective good, but in case of this Latin group the collective goods can be provided because of these two factors. The first one is the presence of a kind of core sense of the individuals in the group and the second one is the provision of incentives may be in terms of positive rewards to those individuals who are working towards fulfillment of the collective goods in the group itself. And if it is so then these individuals are called as the mobilized Latin groups they work towards fulfilling the uh, group objectives in obtaining this collective goods because of these two factors that is the coercions that are existing for the individuals and the second one is incentives in terms of positive rewards. Because of these two factors now the individuals they will be motivated to work towards achieving the collective goods for providing this collective goods in the in the group itself and they are known as the mobilized Latin group. So, now let us discuss about the kind of difference that we are finding so far the incentives are concerned. So, sometimes the small groups or privileged groups as well as the intermediate groups they may lead to economic and social incentives which lead their members to obtain the collective goods. And it is not necessary that we will be getting the economic incentives always sometimes the social inten, uh, incentives can also play roles in, in, in providing uh, the collective goods as well. Whereas, the large or Latin groups they will lead to no incentive and no social pressure lead their members to obtain a collective goods. So, this is the distinction that the, the very factor incentives or creating incentives which can actually create or which can actually create a situations for providing or not providing the collective goods for uh, to the small groups as well as the Latin groups. And in case of this large group or Latin groups as you understand that there is lacking a case of incentives and that is why economic and social pressure is almost nil and that is why the collective goods are not provided to them. So, there is a need for the, the kind of institutions to be created so that the institutions will be forcing or providing some uh, mechanisms in terms of coercions or in terms of inducements or creating incentives so that these members in the large and Latin groups they can work towards for the uh, achievement of the collective good. So, the, uh, the ongoing discussion that we are having it may it is leading to this conclusion is that 
size is one of the determining factors in deciding whether or not it is possible that the rational pursuit of the individual interest will bring forth the group oriented behavior. So, if the size is small then the individuals will be going towards fulfilling the group oriented behaviors and if the size is large or latent you are saying then the likely uh, effect for getting or the, the, the chance of getting this, this uh, group oriented behavior is less. So, far the two groups are concerned the small groups are not only qualitatively, but also quantitatively different from the large groups and that is why you can say in the in the small groups they uh, it is easier to find and provide the collective goods, but in large groups it is very difficult. And so far the effectiveness is concerned then obviously, we will be preferring the small groups because it is easier to find the collective goods and the size of the groups is small and the participants. Uh, so, in this context Olson actually narrated this situation that why we will be preferring a small group or why the effective, effectiveness of a small group will be high in providing a um, uh, collective good. So, he wrote that when the number of participants is large the typical participant will know that his own efforts will probably not many not make much difference. So, if once one individual or one individual members effort is not making any difference in terms of outcome then obviously, there would be less inducement. And he knows that the individual or he himself will be affected by the meetings decisions or decisions that are actually binding for all. So, in this case this situation is providing less incentives to work further in achieving the group objectives. And that is why the action taking groups if you are finding empirically the action taking groups or the subgroups tended to be more uh, much smaller than the non action taking groups or subgroups. So, why you are saying that action taking groups or subgroups subgroups they are tended to be much smaller than the non action taking groups and subgroups because we can take the case of a committee. The committees should be small if we are expecting action we can see that that with the committee for fixing the minimum wage or the committee for fixing the minimum uh, support price for the crops. So, there the size of the committee is small, but if we want the non action taking groups or subgroups then it should be relatively small, because we want or we are looking forward the points of suggestions their views and reactions on a particular matter. That is why it is uh, it is said that if we want to know the action itself then action taking groups or subgroups they should be very small. Then in comparison to the non action taking groups or subgroups. So, this is the the example that why uh, if we need some actions to be taken the size should be, should be small and that is why in this context he argues the effectiveness of the small size the group size should to be small. And uh, so far the social incentives and rational behavior is concerned as he argued and argued against the established group behavior that rational individual will be motivated by their um, uh, rationality and that is why they will be trying to achieve the single individual objectives whereas, thus they will not follow the same rational behavior in achieving the group objectives when they become the member of that group. And sometimes we are also finding this economic incentives are not the only incentives the social incentives in terms of creation of prestige possessing a special kind of treatment or respect in the society. They also are helpful 
in creating incentives. So, that can also be taken into account in, in treating the groups so that the collective actions can also be provided. So, in this discussion we need to understand that what are the determinants of performing a successful group actions, what would be the factors which can lead to successful group actions. The first thing in our discussion we are finding it is the size of the group. If the size of the group is small, it may lead to a successful group action that is what he argued. And the second one is creating the right kind of incentives or the mechanism of selective incentives. So, the incentives is right, it is selective, then it can motivate the individual members to act towards achieving the group objectives. So, in this context after understanding the whole of this uh, core uh, logic or argument of Olson's theory on the group behavior and collective action, we need to actually see that this piece of work was argued in 1965 and it is almost we have already uh, crossed 50 years. So, in this context taking the social, uh, social um, situations into account what would be the efficacy or what is what is the effectiveness of this theory in today's world that we need to ponder over we need to go through the current collective action issues that we are finding in so many cases of pollutions in managing uh, in managing the issues like environmental problems then we can actually think about that whether the very theory is still applicable in solving the current collective action problems that we are facing. Thank you very much.